Well, good morning and happy Resurrection Sunday. And I just want to extend a special welcome to those of you who may be visiting with us for the first time and to those of you who are with us for the first time in maybe a long time. We are very, very glad that you are here, even if it may be by way of a very persistent friend, neighbor, or family member uh, that had to maybe twist your arm a little bit to get here. But hey, just remember, it's, it's all because they love you, right? It's all because they love you. It's all about the love. So hey, it's Easter Sunday, which means we are here today to celebrate to celebrate God's once and for all victory over sin and death through his son, Jesus, by the power of his glorious resurrection. That it is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus extends his victory over sin and death to us, to all of humanity, that Jesus' victory becomes our victory, that we can receive his free gift of salvation by making the decision to trust in him to be king over our lives by grace through faith in him alone. And is this good news that has been at the center of our sermon series for the past two months where we have been in the Gospel of John looking at Jesus' seven I am statements that he makes throughout the Gospel of John where he reveals to us in his own words his identity, his character, and his mission. Because the truth is that A lot of different things are said about Jesus depending upon who you ask. And so what we've decided to do is that we've decided to just go right to the source, to hear from Jesus himself in his own words, tell us directly who he is and what he is all about. And what we found is that Jesus declares time and time again that he is the promised Messiah, that he is the Son of God who has come not to condemn the world, not to condemn the world, but come to a world that was already condemned in itself because of sin, and that Jesus has come rather to rescue the world to save the world from sin why, by believing in Jesus, you may have life in his name. And so this morning, we're going to be finishing our sermon series. We're going to be capping it off with the fifth of the seven uh, of Jesus' seven I am statements that we've saved this one for Easter's Resurrection Sunday morning because this fifth one is where Jesus proclaims to us In John chapter 11, Jesus says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. And what we're going to see from studying our passage together this morning is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has the power to transform our lives and redefine our past, present, and future. So let me just say that one more time, because this is, this is going to be our, our one point or our main point this morning, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has the power to transform our lives and redefine our past, present, and future. And so with that being said, if you have a Bible, you can open it up to John chapter 11. That's where we're going to be this morning. And if you don't have a Bible, if you go to nmbchurch.org, our website, right on that homepage, if you scroll to the bottom, you can download our free app onto your phone. And in that app is a free ESV Bible where, that you can use and follow along. And we always feel that it's important that you follow along so you know for sure that I'm not making this stuff up as I go along. And so our, our passage where we're going to focus is about halfway down in John chapter 11. But before we get there, uh, I'm just going to help uh, speed things up and set things up for us that Uh, just to give us a little bit of context this morning before we get to our our passage. And so coming out of John chapter 10, what happens is, is that in John chapter 10, Jesus openly proclaims his deity by claiming that he and the Father 
are one. And as a result, the scribes and the Pharisees, they accuse Jesus of blasphemy and they try to stone him to death. And being that it was not yet Jesus' time to die, that Jesus knew that he was going to go to the cross, but his time had not yet come, Jesus and his disciples, they leave Jerusalem where this takes place and they go to the other side of the Jordan River. And so while they're on the other side of the Jordan River and they're doing ministry there, word comes to Jesus that a man named Lazarus had become gravely ill. And it just so happens that Lazarus was part of a family that we know that Jesus was exceedingly close with and and that Jesus loved a great deal. Not just Lazarus, but but Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha. In fact, it was Mary and Martha that sent word to Jesus to let them know that their, their, their brother was gravely ill and for Jesus to come. But Jesus assures everybody, don't worry, he says Lazarus isn't going to die and his illness is actually going to serve the purpose of revealing the glory of God in Jesus and affirming his identity. And this is really going to be key to our passage because Jesus is essentially telling them, hey guys, I know it's going to look like one thing. I know it's going to look like one thing, but trust me, as this unfolds, as this plays out, it's going to mean something entirely different than you ever could understand or imagine. And it's actually going to end up redefining your past, present, and future reality. And and so just, just take that and put it in the back of your head. And so after two days passed, Jesus tells his disciples that it was time to go to see Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary, in Bethany. And Bethany was right outside of Jerusalem. Now, this would require going back to the region where Jesus' life was threatened. So understandably, the disciples expressed concern for Jesus' well-being. But Jesus essentially tells them, hey, don't worry about it. We're going to go and everything's going to be okay. However, before they go to Bethany, Jesus gives them a heads up. And he tells them in verse 11, hey guys, our friend Lazarus, he's fallen asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. I'm going to wake him up. Now, the disciples, they're kind of slow to catch on here. And they take what Jesus says literally. And so they're like, Jesus, we don't understand. We're going back to this region where everybody, where the the scribes and the Pharisees tried to stone you to death, and and Lazarus is just sleeping? Like, do we really need to risk our our lives to go wake him up? Can't can't he just get, like, you know, an alarm clock or something like that? So so Jesus says, no, 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 let me me spell it out for you. And he says in verses 14 and 15, he says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Essentially, everything has played out this way. I knew all about it, and it's played out this way for a purpose. And so this leads to even more confusion where where one of the disciples, Thomas, is like, yeah, let's go so we can all die together. And Jesus is like, what are you guys talking about? Uh, Whatever. So he says, all right, we're going to go. Okay, and so they all depart for Bethany together. And so this brings us up to speed now where we're going to read our passage together. John chapter 11, verses 17 through 27, and then we're going to break it all down together. So John chapter 11, verse 17, we read, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So, We see here that Jesus, he rolls into Bethany, 
And the first thing we learn in verse 17 is that Lazarus has in fact died. And not only has he died, but he's been in the tomb for four days. And just so no one gets the wrong idea about this, you know, for, your, for you princess bride fans, Lazarus wasn't mostly dead. He was all the way dead, okay? He's in the tomb four days. There's no doubt about it. And so again, this must have led to a ton of confusion amongst the disciples because the first thing that Jesus said to them when they got word that Lazarus was ill, back in verse 4, if you remember, is that Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so at first glance, it seems like Jesus has really blown it. The disciples must be like, Jesus, you were, you were kind of wrong about this. And so he, he, he comes into Bethany, and now he's about to be confronted by Lazarus' sister, Martha, who is actually known to be the, the rule follower in the family. We know this from an interaction that he has with Martha back in, in, in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. However, we see that she is just in such a state. Of, of grief, and, and her emotions have overcome her to the point where in her grief, she uncharacteristically, she breaks the Jewish custom of staying inside the house for a 30-day period of mourning, and, and she just runs out to meet Jesus when he arrives. And it's here in verses 21 through 24 where we're going to see Martha, she's going to process through her pain in light of her brother's death. And as Martha does this, it provides a window into where she's at with God, her understanding of God, and the status of her relationship with Jesus. And incredibly, we are given a front row seat in seeing how Jesus, being the resurrection and the life, has the power to transform and redefine her past present, and future reality. But before Jesus can do this, Martha needs to process through her grief. And so Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to be with her, and she's going to process through her grief, and they're going to be together, and we're going to be together with, 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 uh, with Martha along the way here with Jesus. And, and so it begins here in verse 21, where we read that as Jesus arrives, Martha runs out to meet him and immediately says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So the first thing that Martha does when she sees Jesus is she straight away brings up the past by essentially telling Jesus, if you would have been here, things would have been different. Jesus, if, if only you would have came, things wouldn't have played out this way. Things would have, things would have been different. And Jesus, why didn't you come? We sent word for you. Why, did, why didn't you come? Pastor Matt Chandler from the Village Church in Dallas, Texas, he has a great series on the seven I am statements of Jesus. And when he comes to this text, he does a great job digging into what it must have been like for Martha and Mary, who they sent word to Jesus to come. To, to heal their brother. They knew Jesus had the power to heal. They, they, they had seen what Jesus could do. And so they send word. But after they send word, think about it. They're waiting. They're waiting and waiting. And they're just, just in this agonizing state of, of, of just waiting for Jesus to come. And they're trying to, 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 to nurse their brother. And they're trying to hold off this, this illness that had just stricken their brother. And just saying, if, if we could just hold on. If we could just hold on until Jesus gets here, everything is going to be okay. And so they're forced to watch their brother slowly disintegrate. Because Jesus, he never, he never comes. And so we can understand the painful disappointment that Martha was processing through after she feels that Jesus no-shows. And she was forced to watch her brother die. And so we acknowledge the emotion of Martha's words when she says in, to Jesus in verse 21, Lord, if only if you had been here, if you had been here. And for many of us, we can resonate with Martha because we too have gone through something in our past, whether it be a loss of a loved one, an illness, a, a disappointing 
circumstance. Maybe we've even been victimized in some way where we were forced to endure a, a horrific and unspeakable abuse in some fashion. And so we come before God and we say, God, where were you? Where were you, God? Where were you, Jesus? Where were you when I needed you the most? You say in your word that you will never leave me or forsake me. And when I needed you the most, you weren't there. We feel that God no-showed on us. And so because we feel that God wasn't there for us when we needed him the most, it's just easier if we block God out of our lives completely. Because we put ourselves out there and we feel so disappointed, we feel so hurt, we say, I'm never going to allow myself to feel that way, to feel that hurt again. And so we, we shut God out of our lives. And this might be where some of us may be today in our current relationship with God. And so we see Martha, she's in such a state of grief that, that often that we, we go through the different stages of, of grief. And so she's, she's, what we're going to see in verse 22 is that she's going to move on from the past now she's going to shift to the present in verse 22 where she says, But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And so what we see is there's a huge shift that takes place where, where now Martha has gone from speaking her feelings and the raw emotion that is in her heart in verse 21 and now in verse 22 she totally changes course to the pat religious Sunday school type answer of what she thinks she's supposed to say. She backpedals. Ooh, what I said, that was kind of offensive. Let me say now what I'm supposed to say. And for some of us, how I identify this is that this is a, a, a type of denial. Because we choose to re respond this way because we feel, simply feel like the pain is just too much for us to de deal with. And so let me just say what I'm supposed to say. Let me just do what I'm supposed to do. Let me just move forward with this because I, I just don't want to deal with this anymore. This is just too painful. Let's just get past this. And so we kind of sweep matters under the rug. And so what we see is that Martha, what she's done is she's completely swung to the opposite side of the spectrum in her unhealthy emotional behavior. And this, this type of form of denial. And when we do this, it's like saturating our souls with an anesthetic where we eventually become completely numb towards God. Instead of engaging and dealing with our pain, we choose to not really deal with it. And of course, this is just as toxic as choosing to be bitter and angry with God. Because if God wanted us to behave like robots, he would have created us to be robots. But instead, he created us with emotions. He created us to have an authentic relationship with him. And so, as we know, there's nothing more harmful to a relationship when we choose to turn ourselves off emotionally. So this now leads us to verses 23 and 24 where Martha in her grief, she completes the cycle in going from the past to the present and now to the future. We read in verses 23 and 24, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, oh, I know. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And so Martha in her grief, now she shifts to this kind of distorted type of acceptance that entirely disregards the past and the present and is completely focused on the future. And for some of us, we can deceive ourselves by coming to the conclusion that since there's nothing we can do about our, our past, that we just need to accept the fact that the present, it's not how we would like it to be. It's always going to be disappointing. It's always going to let us down. It's always going to, to stink. And so therefore we adopt this martyr-like, joyless, fatalistic attitude where we have the single-mindedness upon the future where we just need to white-knuckle it and get through this life until God comes and makes everything better at the end. And while there's great truth 
that in having saving faith in Jesus Christ, it enables us to look forward to the day of being in glory with the Lord, where it brings us great comfort in knowing that the Lord is going to restore all things unto himself, and that when we have faith in Christ, we're going to be a part of that restoration. However, however, when we misappropriate the resurrection to only the future, it disengages us from the mission of God and robs us of the blessings God wants to give us in the here and now. It robs us of the joy that God has for us in the present. We read that Jesus says in John 15, 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Now for those of us, if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that, that the joy of the Lord is to be at the center of our lives. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. I'm talking, not talking about happiness. I'm talking about joy. Happiness is fleeting. It's circumstantial. It comes and goes. You might have been happy this morning where you got here early and you're like, oh, I got a great parking spot. I'm so happy. You came in here. You know, you got your pastels on. You got a strut in your step. You got a great seat. You're feeling good. Then you sit down. You take a sip of your coffee. You spill it on your shirt. There goes the happiness. It's gone. There's a difference between happiness and joy. When we have joy, right, the joy of the Lord is able to endure hardships and difficult circumstances. And so, now the Mar- and so now that Martha, in her grief, she's gone through the gamut of her emotions, the time has now come for Jesus to apply the power of the resurrection like only he can into Martha's life. And what we're going to see is that the power of the resurrection is going to redefine her past present, and future reality. It's going to redefine her understanding of everything. Everything. That's going to result in complete transformation. And so let's move ahead and read verses 25 through 27. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And so Jesus says to Martha here, Martha, 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 the solution that you're looking for, that you're seeking, that you're you're all over the map right now, the solution that you're looking for, it's not within you. You can't figure this out on your own. You can't come to your own understanding. The solution's not inside of you. And so for all of us, we've all been, uh, some way or another, we've been raised by Disney. We've been led to believe that the solution to all of our problems are within. Right? If we just believe in ourselves, we try hard enough, everything's going to work out in the end. Right? Disney really messed us up with that. It's really not true, as we've all found out, that the more we turn inward, the worse things get, the worse we mess things up. And so Jesus says to Martha here, Martha, Martha, stop trying to deal with this on your own. The solution is not within yourself. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the solution. I am the solution. I stand before you. I am God in the flesh that has come to take the hope of the resurrection. And I'm going to redefine your past, present, and future. So following Jesus' I am statement here, Jesus then has an interaction with Martha's sister Mary in verses 28 through 37. And not that this interaction isn't important. That's why we don't think that this interaction is unimportant. And that's not why we're skipping over it. But our focus this morning is on this interaction with Martha. And so we're going to skip forward to verse 38 where Jesus picks this back up with Martha. And so we're going to read in verses 38 through 40. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. 
Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You see, throughout this passage, Jesus has said time and again, whether it be to his disciples or to Martha, that this has all happened for a purpose. Remember I told you in the beginning to what Jesus says back in verse 4, to put that in the back of your mind? Well, the time has come where this is going to unfold, that this is going to all play out. That this is all transpired for a purpose. That our lives are not without purpose. Right? We're not just aimlessly floating in the universe. That God has a purpose for our lives. He has a will for our lives. And so God says, this has all happened for a reason. Believe in me. I'm going to show you. Just believe in me. Trust me. And this is all going to unfold. And it's going to make sense in the end. And so this is all transpired for the purpose of revealing in Jesus the glory of God. And so Jesus says this, like I said, back in verse 4, when he first gets word of Lazarus' illness, he says it again in verse 15, before they left for Bethany, and he says this in his I am statement, where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And what does he ask Martha? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And how does Martha respond? It says in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe. And so now Jesus is re- kind of telling her in verse 40, he's saying, Martha, I think, I know that you think you know that you know, but you don't know. You don't know. You think you understand. You think, I know you believe in me. I know your heart's in the right place. I know you believe that, that, that I'm the Messiah. But, but your mind has not fully even scratch the surface to comprehend the implications of me being the Messiah, the Son of God, that I am the resurrection and life, and what that means for your life and the entire universe. But guess what? You're about to find out. Do you believe this? She says, yes. He goes, okay, I'm, I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you. And so we read in verses 41 through 44. So they took away the stone And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. When Lazarus comes out of the tomb, what happens to everything that Martha thinks she knows? It's gone. It's out the window. Everything that she knew about life Because of the resurrection, it's completely transformed. It's completely redefined. What happens to everything that Martha went through? Past, present, future. Completely transformed. Completely redefined. Everything changes. Everything she thought she knew and tried to make sense of in her life has completely gone out the window. Past, present, and future. Completely transformed. Completely redefined. That's the power of the resurrection. That's what Jesus will do for you in your life. That's what Jesus has done to reality itself. He has completely transformed and redefined everything. Because if Jesus Christ is who he says he is and has done what the Bible says he has done, which we know to be true through a ton of biblical scholarship, centuries of biblical scholarship and archaeology and an avalanche of historical documentation, whether it's a liberal or conservative historians. Everything we think we know about this life, past, present, or future, has gone out the window because death is no longer part of the equation. Jesus has put death to death, and when he does that, that changes everything. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ demands that we change our perspective on everything. That the moment Lazarus steps out of that tomb, think about how it redefines Martha's past, present, and future. It's like a mother giving birth to her child, where where initially the experience, it's defined by the, the, the pain of childbirth. However, with the arrival of the child, a transformation takes place, doesn't it? Where now the experience has been redefined by the joy of the baby that that mother now holds in her arms. See, what we are now able to see in light of the resurrection is how God has the power to bring life and redemption to our hardships and trials. It's not that Jesus wasn't there. It wasn't that Jesus no-showed. Jesus doesn't no-show us in our hardships and trials. It's not that Jesus puts us through those hardships and trials. That's the reality of living in a world marred by sin. Jesus has come to rescue us from sin. Jesus has come so that when we go through those hardships and trials, it's not for nothing. That he has come to give us redemption and to redeem our suffering. That we no longer have to allow our experience to define us as a victim held captive and crippled by our bitterness or our circumstances. But rather in Christ, we now have the power to overcome. Our past doesn't define us. Jesus defines us. The resurrection defines us. We now have life in his name. That where sin was intent on destroying us, the resurrection gives us the power to redefine our sin, to redefine our brokenness, where God now allows it to be a part of our redemption story and making us stronger and bringing about new life in us. Now we're able to, to now minister to others and to be a testimony to God's resurrection power that when others are suffering, we can say, hey, that doesn't have to define you. That doesn't have to kill you. Look at me. Look at what God has done in my life. We can now see that there was a purpose to our past and a purpose to our pain. That everything God does is oriented towards redemption. Because that's the story of the cross. Where God takes what was meant for evil and he redefines it into the greatest gift the world has ever known. in extending us salvation from sin and death to the entire world, that no longer is the cross a symbol of judgment. Now it has been redefined as the universal symbol of salvation, of eternal life, that that's the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of Easter. And this is what God wants to do for you in your past, present, and future. That because of the resurrection, we no longer have to have a shallow faith where we simply say what we think we're supposed to say because we fear judgment. And condemnation. No longer do we have to engage in in, in empty, hollow, and and powerless religion that is rooted in guilt and superstition that, that doesn't have the power to do anything for us. That through the cross, Jesus extends his victory over sin and death to us, whereby grace through faith in him alone, we can enjoy a personal relationship with the God of the universe. And with that comes a depth of faith. We now can share our lives openly with God, without fear. That God now, he, he, he stops being an object of fear and condemnation in our life, but now he becomes the, the object of, of, of the center of our joy. As we read in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. That you don't have to worry any longer. You don't have to be anxious any longer. Why? Because God cares for you. How do I know that God cares for me? Because of the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. He doesn't just say it. He has shown us. He has shown his love to us. And so when we make the decision to surrender control of our lives to Jesus Christ, we receive his resurrection power that redefines our past, present, and future that we go from being dead in our sins to now being alive in Christ. That we get to actually receive the Spirit of God. Where God's Spirit actually lives inside of us. And now it enables us to enter into a new reality, which is the kingdom of God. And so when we look all, all around our world today, and it seems like everything is just so messed up. We're like, how did it get this way? God says, no, no, I'm pulling you out of that world. You're going to live in my kingdom now. You're going to live the way that I intended you to live. 
that God enables us to become the best version of ourselves, the person that God created us to be, where we're able to live under the rule and reign of God, where we're able to have the peace of God that transcends all understanding, that peace, that fulfillment that we've all always longed for. Now, if you just think that, all right, it's Easter Sunday and the preacher got excited, I don't know about this. He's trying to sell me. If you don't believe me, what I want you to do is just ask the people sitting around you. Because you are right now in the midst of an ocean full of resurrection power. Because this church is not a building, it's not an organization but it is a people that have been brought together by the Spirit of God, made up of resurrection stories where there are new ones added to our number regularly, where God, by his grace, continually brings people in this community that we all live in together, in this community, he brings people from death to life, where people are regularly being pulled out of addiction, that marriages are being restored, Families are being healed. People are being rescued from anxiety. People are being saved from destructive living. They're being delivered from materialism and the empty promises of this world that always fail us and never seem to fulfill us. So how do we know God is real? How do we know the resurrection is real? Just look around you. So it's our prayer that if you haven't yet received the new life that God has for you through the power of his resurrection, that you would make the decision today to be added to the number of changed lives that you are in the presence of this morning. In fact, we're, as Nick said in the beginning of the service, we're going to have a special service next week at 10.45 a.m. We're not going to have a 9 a.m. service, only one service next week at 10.45 because we all want to be together for this where we're going to be celebrating God's resurrection power in the lives of several people who are going to be sharing their stories of how Jesus has rescued them from the power of darkness and has redefined their lives by giving them life in his name. We'd love for you to be here and to be a part, part of it and to witness this for yourself. Hey, one last thing I got for you. Can you do me a favor today, this morning? As you sit around, whether it be the dinner table Lunch table, maybe, maybe you're doing brunch today. I don't know what you're doing. But if, if, if there's that friend, that neighbor, that family member that invited you here or brought you here today, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to ask them how Jesus has redefined their life. How has Jesus redefined their past, present, and future? And I want you to ask them where would they be today if it weren't for Jesus entering their life? with his resurrection power. You see, the reason that we know how Jesus is the resurrection and the life is because we aren't here today to celebrate Lazarus. Lazarus would eventually succumb to death just like every other normal human being. However, this isn't the case with Jesus. You see, when Jesus rose from the grave, he stayed alive. Jesus is alive, and he is at work today around the globe, redefining people's past, present, and future realities and bringing them from death to life, calling them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And this is why we are here this morning. This is what we are here celebrating together this morning, that Jesus Christ has defeated sin and death forever because of the power of his resurrection, because he is, in fact, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace and love that you have for us. That while we stood condemned because of our sin, you came and you left heaven and you pursued us at our very worst. That while we were still sinners, Jesus, you came to us. You pursued us. You showed your love for us by living the perfect life we could never live and dying the death that, that we deserved in our place. 
so that in our sin, as we face condemnation, you reach your arm of salvation out to us and extend to us eternal life. That is by the power of the resurrection you offer to redefine our past, present, and future. You offer to give us purpose, to give us hope, to give us joy, to know true love because your word says that God is love. And so, Father, I pray this morning that if there's anybody here who has not yet trusted in you as Lord and Savior, that they would take that step today, that they would receive your free gift and the calling that you have put upon their life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord together through song.